welcome and uh, thanks for for uh, coming here and uh, to uh, to listen to what our our Fulbright scholars have to say um, I'm very happy to uh, to welcome them and you of course as well the audience and Belinda as uh, the uh, the uh, the director of, of, uh, of Fulbright Iceland uh, I'm I find it a little bit strange. I think this is the the first time that I've I've had to uh, be been in the position that I that I have to both uh, uh, welcome myself and thank myself for for being here, because <laughs> because I'm I'm on both both sides. I'm I'm uh, I'm the chairman of the of the board at Fulbright Iceland, and and I'm also uh, here at this institute as a professor and as dean of the. Uh, of the School of Business and Science. So, uh, yeah, so I, I thank myself, then, but <laughs> most, mostly you guys, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's gonna be, it, it's a really a, a, a great, uh, great honor, great opportunity. It, it enriches very much our campus. As you know, we are, we are a small campus and uh, most of our students are distant students. So it's, it's a, it's a, it really enriches uh, the, uh, the the life here uh, here at the, the University of Akureyri to have you guys here and I'm very very grateful for that. Um, so uh, yeah, so so we are going to uh, to hear what you've been 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 doing, I suppose, or whatever you want to tell us. Really, <laughs> we we're, we're all ears. Uh, so uh, yeah, so Dr. Elizabeth Mendenhall from University of Rhode Island, right? Uh, and uh, Christina Gaithel from 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 uh, Maryland, and uh, Dr. Evan Team, sorry, <laughs> from from uh, from University of Kansas, right? Yeah, I got that all that right. That's 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 great. <laughs> so yeah, just welcome and enjoy. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Otter. Um, I'd like to say a few words in Icelandic first, and then I'm going to say a few words in Icelandic, and then we'll go, go into English. So, yeah, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you, Otter, for that. Otter is the first full-time of the school in Akureyri, here in the East Fulbright Stopping. And it's been a very good idea that we have been working on this year with Fulbright for all the school in Iceland, not just for the people who are in Reykjavík. Og það að fá svo inn hérna, fulltrúa frá háskólum og akureyri hefur verið bara alveg frábært fyrir okkur sem stopnun. Og hérna, eins og hann sagði, þá munu þessi þrýr styrk þegar fara yfir það sem þau hafa verið að gera hér á síðustu mánuðum. Og það, þetta er í fyrsta sinn sem við höldum þetta sem við köllum Fulbright Forum hér á akureyri og það var komin tími til, held ég, ekki það ekki. Og hérna, þannig að það er bara alveg rosalega gaman að hafa ekki komið og verið með ykkur hérna. Sérstaklega það sem háskóla og akurinn er búin að, eða er orðin mjög mikilvægur samstafsaðili stofnunarinnar. Hérna, við kunnum virkilega að meta þetta samstaf sem að við eigum við háskóla og akurinn og sérstaklega kunnum við að meta hvað vel er tekið á móti þeim styrkþegum sem háskólinn sækist eftir að fá. Þeir sína það í verki hér að, hérna, að þeir kunna meta fullbreytt samstarfið. Og mér langar að þakka kannski sérstaklega rektor háskólans, Jólfi Guðmundsinni, fyrir hans, sko, hvað hann hefur verið svona ötu talsmaður fullbreytt samstarfsins hér í háskólanum. Og mér langar líka til að minnast á Rúnar Gunnarsson, hérna, sem er með alþjóðamáli, nú er líka mikilvægur samstarfsaðili okkar. Og svo ekki síst vil ég þakka öllum þeim sem eru gestgjafar, fúlbræt hérna styrkþegan okkar og taka svona vel á móti þeim, hjálpa þeim að verða hluti af samfélaginu hér á Akureyri á meðan þeir eru hérna og það er okkur mjög dýrmætt og við kunnum virkilega meta það. So today of course we're, we are hearing from these uh, three Fulbright scholars who have all been affiliated with the University of Akureyri. Some of our scholars are sometimes affiliated with different research institutes here uh, in the north but but uh, this time they're all here at the University of Akureyri. 
Um, and uh, so two of them have been involved in Arctic projects, uh, but we also take very seriously our commitment to uh, offer grants in a wide variety of disciplines. Uh, where we can assist universities to increase collaboration and knowledge, right? So um, we have been very happy in the past years to provide a number of scholars to the Pro Polar Law Program here at UNAC. And uh, this cooperation is a great example of how well Fulbright and the University of Akureyri have, full, have cooperated in the past years up here in the North. And a shining example of that cooperation is Dr. Elizabeth Mendenhall, uh, who is visiting from the University of, of Rhode Island. So I'm going to start by inviting her to come up here. I'm Beth Mendenhall from the University of Rhode Island. I need to stay please, here? Please stay oh, okay. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I love to gesture. Um, the motto of the University of Rhode Island is think big, we do. So Fulbright Iceland was a perfect fit. These are the things I'm going to talk about today with a special focus on my Fulbright research project. And I want to warn you now that I've taken thousands of photos here in Iceland, and they will be all throughout the presentation. I won't address them all specifically, but there is a logic to their order, and I'm happy to answer specific questions if we have time at the end. So why Fulbright? Uh, my PhD is in international relations, so Fulbright was sort of a, a perfect fit from the get-go. But I actually didn't know about Fulbright until a few years ago. And the, the reason I started to investigate opportunities like this is at my college, there's a real expectation for external grant funding. And I had struggled to find a grant program that would fit with my research interests and expertise. Every time I applied to something, I, I found myself having to morph my project ideas into something that felt very distant from what I wanted to do. And so Fulbright allowed me an opportunity to pursue the research I wanted to in the place that I needed to be to do that. Why I chose Iceland is honestly an easy um, answer. It was just the best fit. The polar law program here at the University of Akureyri was looking for, among other things, someone with expertise in law of the sea which is what I research and teach back home in the Department of Marine Affairs. Um, so that is the reason I chose this program, that it would sort of maximize my chances of getting a Fulbright, maximize my chances of getting to do the research that I wanted to do. But I also saw a good fit for the research because in my time studying the law of the sea, Iceland kept coming up. They kept being visible. They kept having a presence and an influence. So I knew there was a research project waiting to be done investigating Iceland's role influencing the law of the sea. So I found out I got this Fulbright in January of 2021. So I had a whole year to mentally prepare. In December of 2021, I threw myself a going away party where I put my research question on an ice cream cake, which I assume is a normal thing to do. <laughs> So this is an overview of my time in Iceland, and I'll, I'll go over a lot of this, focusing especially on the research um, through this presentation, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. The first is that in my first three days here, I went to the National Museum in Reykjavik because I wanted to get a sense of how Iceland saw its own history, how it presented itself as a state in the international community. And it's a fantastic museum, but actually I was kind of disappointed with how little time and space was devoted to the 20th century. So it kind of left me with more questions than answers. Throughout my time, I followed up and I went to the Maritime Museum in Reykjavik, which I think is more appropriately named the Fisheries Museum. So it really helped me go deep in one area, but I had more questions. I went to the Whales and Whaling Museum in Husavik, which will be featured in my presentation later throughout. Um, so Iceland really offered a lot of resources for learning about Iceland while I was here. Another thing I'll point out is that in February, I was in a steps competition. So I've become one of those people that counts how many steps I take per day. And this was with a team back home, other professors at my university, but it really affected my Fulbright experience because I walked all over this town <laughs> and I walked through the snow and the dark and the storms. Um, and it really it impressed upon me how much people in this community really get out as much in February as they do in April or I assume May. 
Um, and I also learned important personal lessons, like, and I'm just going to walk over and gesture. <laughs> if you're going to walk in a snowstorm, do not leave your hood down because you'll end up with a bucket full of snow. Um, March was very intense. I traveled to present my research at a conference. I did a panel at Reykjavik University, and I spent two weeks following these negotiations at the United Nations that had a nice intersection with other projects I'd been doing, but also my Fulbright project. So I'm sort of short on time, but if you have questions about any of these, you can ask at the end. I did do some guest lecturing here in the Polar Law Program on these three topics. Um, they reflected expertise that I already had, but the three hour kind of seminar format of courses here forced me or gave me the opportunity rather to go deeper. So I did a lot of research to prepare for these lectures and I really found um, that the students brought a lot of their own expertise to the classroom which I'm used to that in a graduate classroom, but it was sort of different expertise and different experiences here. So I really got out a lot from this guest lecturing experience. I did have to work on other papers. Um, I co-author a lot. And so I had four ongoing projects during this semester that, you know, you can't just say I'm in Iceland, I have to drop all these other paper projects. This sort of explains how I was spending some of my time. The first two papers were carryovers from the fall semester. And these last two papers were in response to the fact that this negotiation session at the United Nations is for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction happened in the middle of my Fulbright term. So I was studying that, I was analyzing it and authoring papers with my co-authors. So I, the Fulbright project is my main focus and priority, but I was doing these other things along the way. So my overall research question was what are the strategies and mechanisms used by Iceland to influence the progressive development of the law of the sea? I knew that Iceland had had an influence and that was sort of my starting point, establishing these are Iceland's foreign policy preferences and these are how they're reflected in the law of the sea. And then really focusing my research on how did that happen? What did Iceland do to increase the chance that its preferences would be reflected in the law? So I came in with the idea of covering four cases um, that cover the 20th century and the 21st century. These uh, treaty negotiations are ongoing right now. They cover living resource issues and non-living resources. The continental shelf, mostly the concern is minerals and fossil fuels. And I'm going to sort of walk through this, um, but I want to start by saying I had grand visions for how much I would accomplish here. And I have accomplished a lot, but the project is still at draft stage. Maybe it's a little updated from that, um, but I'm still working on this. I still have questions that I need to answer. The starting point for me was a review of the literature on small states and what kind of strategies and mechanisms they typically use. Because although Iceland is, is covered a bit in this literature, the real focus is on small island states or micro states. But I knew there were lessons here that I could apply to my project. So Iceland is unquestionably a small state. And there's a, a lot of debate in the literature about how to define a small state, what the threshold should be. But perhaps the most important thing is that Iceland perceives itself as a small state. If you look at statements from the political leadership or characterizations in popular media, Iceland self-identifies this way in large part because of these limitations on capacity and resources, small size relative to other states, et cetera. But there's a lot that's unique about Iceland. It's geography, certainly. But also the fact that Iceland is a former territory of Denmark. It was part of independence movements in the 20th century. But its experience as a territory of Denmark is very different than the experiences of other former territories or former colonies, say in Africa or Southeast Asia. And so from its very beginning as a sovereign territorial state, it, it, it was a part of the international system designed by the West after World War II. So it's a founding member of NATO. When it joined the United Nations early on, it was the smallest country that was a UN member. So it has had a unique experience. Being a small state does mean weakness and vulnerability, but there are also particular strengths that small states have. Um, because the diplomatic capacity is lessened, there are fewer total diplomats, you can have stronger focus on a limited portfolio of issues that really matter to you, issues like fishing. 
And there's also often a stronger connection between what the population is focused on and what diplomats are trying to do on the international stage. So there can be more responsiveness because you don't need to build that domestic attention and support. Certainly Iceland, like many small states, is more economically vulnerable because of its limited number of industries, its limited resources. But like many small states, Iceland can use that to, to build moral authority. So a common example of this is small island states in the Pacific emphasize that they're suffering from climate change, but they didn't cause it. So they're listened to, they have a kind of moral authority they exercise in international negotiations. Iceland has done this on living resource issues as well. And perhaps most importantly is the fact that Iceland is a sovereign state. It has full membership at the United Nations, full voting power, full presence in international organizations. And this is the reason why I focus a lot on international institutions and Iceland's membership in or participation in those institutions. That's a key site of small state influence. So what I've been looking for is strategies and mechanisms. Strategies are things that a small state plans to do in order to have influence. So it might include something like um, a diplomatic practice where you link one issue to another issue and you say, listen, I'll side with you on your issue if you side with me on my issue. Mechanisms are opportunities that small states can use that are created by the context. So for example, if you have a social context where you have a lot of the same community of diplomats that have built deep relationships and see each other a lot, it might create a, an opportunity for persuasion as a strong mechanism to get your way. If you have an institutional context where the voting has to be unanimous, it doesn't matter if your population is much smaller, you have one vote. And so you have the ability to functionally veto the decision-making in that process. So through my four cases, I was looking for strategies and mechanisms employed by Iceland. The first case is fisheries. And if you ask, you know, just the average person, what do you know about Iceland and the ocean? They're probably gonna think about fisheries and the cod wars between the um, Iceland and the UK. I'm coming to this case from a slightly different perspective where my focus has really been on the development of the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. And the story that's typically told about where the 200 mile EEZ came from is that it started with a claim by the US and then the Latin American states responded with their own major claims that was picked up by the African states who brought it to the UN where it got formalized in the Law of the Sea Convention. But throughout this story, Iceland is also expanding its claims all the way up to the 200 nautical mile zone. And so I started by digging deeply into this history of extending the claims. And I found that a lot of the literature focuses on this conflict between the UK and Iceland, and not so much on Iceland's thinking around these claims stepping forward. Clearly it's very important to Icelanders though. Um, the top left there, is a decorative commemorative plate that I came upon um, having lunch at one of the, uh, my fellow faculty members in the Polar Law Program at her house um, that commemorates the extension of the 200 nautical mile zone that she had just kept in her family. Anyway, so in terms of, of uh, strategies, things that I have been focusing on are certainly there was an emphasis on economic vulnerability. These are our fish, we use them, we need them. If we can't have control over these fish, it will be devastating to our people. Judicial precedents, I haven't found evidence for this yet, but I think it's there because this initial claim where Iceland went from normal baselines, which are drawn along the coast, to straight baselines, which are point to point across like the tip of a, the edge of a fjord, and that's their starting point for a claim. They did that one year after Norway won a case in the International Court of Justice saying that this was a legal approach. So I haven't found evidence yet, but I'm interested in whether Iceland was drawing on that judicial precedent to justify their own claims. Um, and then in terms of the uh, unilateral claims, I, I'm expecting to find Iceland pointing to the Latin American states for cover to say, well, we only claimed 50 miles, but Mexico has claimed 200. Chile and Ecuador and Peru have claimed full sovereignty, but we've only claimed a fisheries zone. 
And so I've been searching, you know, documents from the era to look for that relationship, that justification between types of claims. Whaling is probably the case I'm the most behind on, but it's clear that there's something very interesting that happened here. Um, in the 1980s, the International Whaling Commission voted for a moratorium on commercial whaling. A moratorium is a temporary pause, but they kept extending it. Um, so commercial whaling has not been legal under the Whaling Commission since the 80s. Oh, it's before Some commercial whaling states uh, like Norway and the Soviet Union chose to just have a formal rejection of this claim, but they stayed members in the Whaling Commission. Iceland did something different. It left the International Whaling Commission, founded a regional organization, the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission, worked in that to manage commercial whaling, and then later rejoined the International Whaling Commission and then issued a formal objection. So what I'm seeing here is that Iceland wanted to be a good faith member in the international um, organization it was working within, but it wanted to do commercial whaling, and or at least maintain the right to do that. And so they left the forum that wasn't going to allow for that, created a new forum that would manage that and create kind of an international justification for it. But I'm still trying to figure out why they rejoined when they did, what the benefit of that was perceived to be. The biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction negotiations are what first drew my attention to Iceland's role in developing the law of the sea, because I've been studying these negotiations since 2018. And Iceland talks a lot. <laughs> um, they've also had the same representative for the first three sessions. And this, this last session last March, they had a different representative. Um, but he tended to give long speeches and also submit text proposals, like this is what the treaty should say, which a lot of other small states were not doing. Iceland also focused on a more narrow portfolio of issues. They gave a lot of attention to marine protected areas and environmental impact assessments and the kind of institutional architecture that would be created in order to establish those things in the high seas. And a lot of the focus was clearly on fisheries. You can't have protected areas that keep us out from fishing and we don't wanna do impact assessments on fisheries. But they were focused on more than just fisheries. There was a real focus on the institutional arrangements that would be created by the treaty. So like decision-making functions after the treaty entered into force. And they always emphasize practicality. There was this key moment in the third negotiation session where states kept saying again and again, form follows function. We need to figure out what we want the treaty to do and then figure out what institutional arrangements will allow us to do that. Iceland was the only state that said, no, no, function follows form that we all need to be aware that we, there's no appetite to create an organization to make decisions declaring protected areas. No one wants to do that. We need to figure out what we're willing to commit to in terms of creating new organizations that make decisions and then figure out what functions those could possibly take on. And it was a real kind of like everyone paid attention to that moment because they, they could hear that there was something that really rang true about that. In this most recent session, the delegate has emphasized, has pointed out the fact that other delegates keep saying, well, the conference of parties, the members of this treaty, once the treaty is negotiated, they can figure out X, Y, and Z. The Icelandic delegate said that that's not really solving any problems. It's just kicking that can down the road. It's just pushing the problems to later so you can feel like you've accomplished something now. And lastly, initially Iceland took the approach that, listen, in the North Atlantic, we have organizations that work, a fisheries organization we like, an organization that's dealing with pollution. We don't need all this new stuff. They've pivoted in this most recent session, again, emphasizing what will work practically. And they're starting to offer kind of a two, two type approach where if your institutions are working in the North Atlantic, use them to do impact assessments or create protected areas. If they're not, this new treaty can create another process. So instead of just saying, we don't need anything more, they're saying, well, well, we don't necessarily need more, but we understand that you might. And so this, the content of their interventions There's is particularly I know. The last case is claiming the seabed. 
And I don't think actually I'm going to pursue this case. Um, the basics are that the rules for claiming extended seabed are pretty vague in the law of the sea convention. They're from the 70s. And Iceland is making a big claim. So I, I think that they might be kind of taking advantage of the wiggle room there and kind of wiggling it as much as they can. But the data for this is not publicly available. And it's also hard for me to understand <laughs> the data that is available. And I'm not sure it's strategy that's happening here because it's scientists collecting the data and submitting it to other scientists. So it's still on the list. I'm still intrigued by this, but I think that it might need to go in terms of feeding back into the literature on small states. I've been given the five minute warning and now I wanna to transition to me in Iceland. <laughs> um, Due to the um, hospitality of my host and the adventure, um, adventurous characteristics of my fellow Fulbrighters, and the fact that I rented a car for three months, I have done a tour of North Central Iceland, um, gone a lot of places, seen a lot of things, and that was really one of the advantages of being in Akureyri. There's so much to see in this region. I had a lot of the cultural experiences, and my takeaway, um, from this slide, two of them. First, I'm a vegetarian, so I thought the food culture here was not going to be for me, but it is. And the vegetarian food is available and delightful. And my hypothesis is that the ingredients are fresher, like freshness is maybe more appreciated. Maybe it has something to do with hydroponic farms. I don't know, but it's delightful. And then swimming outside in the cold is not so bad, as long as the temperature is warm enough. Um, I'm really into the buildings and the murals. So I just had a slide with my photos of that. I did a lot of things for the first time, including cross country skiing and snowshoeing. You can see I fell in the top left. Um, I did of course ride the horses. It feels different, this pace gate. Like you can tell when your horse starts to do this special Icelandic gait. Um, and this is me looking for the Aurora. It was a real, I had never seen it before in my life and I've only seen it once now, but wow, it's really amazing. And I. I just can't imagine how different it is to grow up in a place where you can see that regularly. In terms of takeaways, I think this is my second to last slide. Um, it really hit me that the sidewalks are so icy. In the United States, they salt everything everywhere. And it, it just really oh, showed me that you can pressing. walk around on ice. When It's just amazing when you're shuffling on the ice and Icelanders are jogging past you. <laughs> Um, community really matters. I, it really, you don't automatically feel welcome in a place. People make you feel welcome. The other Fulbrighters, my host, the students have all made me feel so welcome. And I thought a lot about how I need to do more community building instead of accepting the community building that happens around me. Um, and I really appreciate the community building from the Dean family, in particular, Dean family, if you're watching. <laughs> and I miss salad dressing, but olive oil can be just as good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to submit this for publication for sure. And I do have some leads on Icelandic collaborators and co-authors. I have struggled to feel ready to fully present it and say, are you ready to write text for me? Um, but I have spoken, especially with some collaborators at the uh, Reykjavik University, and I think that they will be interested in, you know, submitting paragraphs to um, the project. The next BB&J negotiations are in August, and I'd like to line up an interview with the Icelandic delegate. Right. Um, we've, there's been discussion about collaborative grant proposals with the folks at Reykjavik University who do Law of the Sea. And lastly, um, I live in Rhode yeah, Island, yeah. Boston Airport is very close and it is very cheap to fly to Iceland in the winter. And now I really understand what's possible and what's not possible in the winter. So I will certainly be back. And this summer I will certainly soak up as much sun as I can. <laughs> so I'm Beth Mendenhall. If you have questions or comments, feel free to contact me. I will be here until June 1st. Um, so you can find me around or I'd be happy to meet up. And thank you so much to the Iceland Fulbright Commission this has been a once in a lifetime opportunity. And thank you to my hosts also to the Polar Law Program, to my fellow Fulbrighters and to Belinda. This has been a wonderful experience. A couple of questions if there are any. We're a little bit behind, but I do <laughs> wanna give in case there's anything um, in particular that anyone would like to ask about. That's it.
question at all. All the questions were answered. <laughs> Everything that was needed to be said. Okay. Um, so, so next, um, we're going to hear from um, Christina, Dr. Christina Guttel. Um, so her grant is funded, she's on the, the Fulbright Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, Arctic Grant, a prestigious grant um, that is funded by the Icelandic Ministry for Foreign Affairs and allows us to bring uh, scholars to Iceland to teach and do research and um, you know, contribute to Iceland's goal of being a center for Arctic scholarship. And so Christina, as was mentioned before, comes to us from the University of Maryland. So take it away. Thank you. Um, so I've learned a couple of things listening to Beth talk, social scientists and natural scientists, very different organization of slides, meaning you have some. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I'm Christina. Uh, at home, I'm stationed at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, or UMSIS, um, and I came here primarily to teach, um, but I've gotten pretty lucky and have found a few new endeavors since I've been here that I'll talk about. Um, so just a little bit about me. Actually, unlike Beth, I knew quite a bit about Fulbright, my undergraduate institution, um, very prolific in it, but I never thought it was something that I would necessarily do. Um, but I got an email from multiple people at my institution going, hey, like you're finishing up. We think you'd be good at this, maybe worth an, worth an apply. Um, and so uh, I applied and found out around the same time as Beth in February of 2021, had about a year to wrap my brain around it. Um, unlike Beth, I actually spent a ton of time in the Arctic, just on the Pacific side in Alaska. Um, so my research, I'm a benthic ecologist by trade, um, which is anything that lives in the mud. So I'm like, Beth, I got a gesture point. Thanks. Um, so this center photo here is what I spend most of my day looking at. Um, clams, worms, amphipods, little crustaceans that live in the mud. Um, and I'm usually dressed more like that last photo. This is actually very uncommon for me. I feel a little out of place in, in presenting clothes, <laughs> um, as some of my coworkers here have commented on this morning already. Um, but my specialty is in clams. Um, I've got a really big soft spot for clams. Um, my students first question day one had never met any of these people. Why clams? Um, there's a really long story, um, but ultimately I think they're really cool. They're a big prey item for um, what we call charismatic megafauna. So the stuff that more people care about like walruses, uh, seals, um, diving sea ducks like eiders. So um, Iceland here has a few species. We get a couple of different, different species in Alaska. Um, and to study these, I do a lot of work um, on ships, and I do both observational and experimental science. But what really kind of drove home this, this Ministry of Foreign Affairs project for me was I work in really large international collaborative projects. Um, and so the Arctic, um, it, oh God, I just really want to leave the mic. The Arctic is a ocean surrounded by land, which when we think about it is kind of really the only place where that exists. So Antarctica is land surrounded by water, but the Arctic is water surrounded by land. Um, and so that brings in a lot of those things that Beth was talking about, which has been one of the best parts of this experience is the three of us that are here, very different um, backgrounds and kind of uh, expertise, but they have it's been really cool to learn from each other. Um, I've never thought so much about fishing rights as I am talking to Beth. I'm just like, hmm, clams, no one cares. I can pick these up off the bottom of the ocean. Um, but it's it's this system that's international. So you, you have to work, um, we call it the pan-Arctic system. So working in the Pacific is great. And I understand my little niche of the world, but I wanted to know what was going on on the Atlantic side um, because it's the most rapidly changing place on the planet. Um, and Iceland's really unique for me because the Pacific side, um, we get this huge benthic community, but as Beth has talked about, fish in Iceland. So it's a much deeper system. The system that I'm more accustomed to is 80 meters at its max, and that is definitely shallower than um, the waters off of Iceland. And so I wanted to bring this idea of working in large international collaborative projects. How do you do it both scientifically? What questions are you asking? Um, but also 
thinking societally and culturally, you get on a boat that's only, you know, 83 meters long and you're working with people from all over the world. I don't know about you guys. I have a hard time sometimes coexisting with people I'm accustomed to in that small of a space for weeks at a time, let alone floating in the middle of the ocean in a really remote location. Um, and so that kind of led me to the project. Um, I called it International Science Collaborations in the Arctic. Um, it was a course that I designed to teach. Um, and when I got here, this was something culturally that was very different, but I really, really love and hope to take back to the US. Um, I walked into Othar's office my like second day here and he was like, let's list it and see what happens. And I'm like, okay, great. The US, it's like this time, this day, months in advance. Um, and sometimes feels almost a little too rigid. Uh, <laughs> so I ended up with a class of six to seven students. Um, and it was a discussion-based course, which after having, I was telling Belinda last night at dinner, um, one of the things that really stuck with me during Fulbright orientation was this idea that they wanted us to have these discussions, um, kind of based courses and, and utilize that technique in our classes. And for me, I love to talk. I'm incredibly extroverted. Um, and so all of my courses are designed as discussion-based. But I think if you're working in the international science realm, it's all about discussions. Um, and I've actually ended up with a research project since I've been here just from talking and having those discussions. Um, and so the class was kind of structured um, thinking about systems. So we talked about the chemical system of both the Atlantic and the Pacific side, the physical system, so currents, temperature, salinity, stuff like, stuff like that, the ecological, but then also the social and the political, um, which is not my realm. So that was great for me to learn more about. Um, but Iceland is really kind of a hub for this stuff. So uh, one of the science bodies, the International Arctic Scientific Committee, um, is actually based on the seventh floor of, of Borger here at the University of Akra. It's housed um, on the same campus, and that is the non-governmental body for all nations interested in the Arctic science, um, and they meet yearly uh, at Arctic Science Summit Week, which I actually went to while I was here in Norway, um, but they meet yearly. It's 25 countries, but the base and the secretariat is housed here on this campus. Um, so the structure of my course, I taught the majority of it, but I had guest lectures both from ecology, or uh, but I gave guest lectures outside of my own course in the ecology class here, as well as in the practical scientific skills course. Um, but I also brought in guest lectures to my course. So I'm a big proponent of, I don't want my students to just hear from me. Um, so this is Ruth Cooper. She's a master's student at George Washington University in the States. Um, and she gave a lecture on diplomacy and science, which is not my realm, but I, so I wanted to bring her in and have, have the students get to um, hear from other people that are um, kind of more experts in some of these broad areas that I really tried to cover. Um, but this led to further collaboration. So um, not only with students, but with faculty, uh, Beth mentioned this learning from your students and having the students kind of engage back with you. I learned a lot about the Akrari sewage treatment. I learned a lot about forensic science and dead bodies. Um, and tried to take those interests from my students and see if I could tie them into the Arctic somehow. But it was really great for me too, because I wanted to hear from them as much as they were learning from me. Um, we're stealing all of Evan Dean's uh, family photos. <laughs> we're stealing all of his thunder. I'm really glad we're going before him. But um, so my course, uh, Sean Spelly here got involved in my course. I had a lot of students in of his students in my class. And we sat down one day. I never in a million years thought I'd work with a microbiologist. I don't like small things. I like things I can see. I have really bad eyesight. So like, I don't, I never in a million years thought microbiology. Um, but we got to talking and he was like, well, what's the microbiome like in clams? And I'm like, not a clue. So we are actually in the process of working on a grant application to do some research. Um, we have our acronym already. We're really proud of it. CLAM Associated Arctic Microbes or CLAM. Uh, <laughs> we're very proud of it. That's about the extent of where we've gotten. Um, but in thinking about um, what's going on and the ultimate goal is for us to start with species in the fjord. So all of these photos are, are of us um, digging for clams just right outside an aetheater. Um, trying to get some live samples. We were not successful, but we had a blast doing it. Um, and it was great because we had, I had a student from my course. We got lucky she was in town. Sean was out there. And then we had the whole Dean family. We were just missing Beth. 
Um, she wouldn't have loved the temperature though. So it's, um, but yeah, so we, we didn't find any clams. We actually did just recently get a bunch of Arctica Icelandica, which I have some photos of. Um, and we're gonna start kind of looking at preliminary data, but this was a project that I did not come to Iceland with. Um, and our goal is to get kind of a baseline here in Iceland and then take it to the Pacific side and say, okay, a lot of the species are similar. Um, or even the same. There are, I know there's clams out there that are the same. I'm gonna find them. Um, but uh, and, and compare and see if the Atlantic versus the Pacific um, has some differences. And so continuing that that outstretch of, of the Pan-Arctic um, idea. Um, so again, this kind of led me to get to teach in the field. So I really love teaching. It's not something I ever thought I would like. Um, so for me, Iceland was a chance to try and do that in a different environment and push myself even further outside my comfort zone. Um, anyone from home that might be watching this is looking at me with a saw going, who gave that to her? Uh, <laughs> I don't have the best track record. Um, but I was able to take skills that I had learned in the field. Um, so what I'm doing is sawing off this um, syringe to take a sediment sample because we just want to know what the surface sediment is doing and what's settling to the bottom. Um, but what I loved about this was I got, like I said, I got to take a student out. So that middle picture is one of my students. Um, she's the one that studies poop and taught me a lot about the aquarium sewage treatment. Um, but then also, again, we're sealing Evan's thunder, his family, <laughs> um, absolute blast, um, and kind of the opportunity that Fulbright offered not only to interact here in the Icelandic community, but also with people that like, I never in a million years would have thought I'd had an occupational therapist family who's from Kansas in the middle of a field in Iceland with me taking sediment samples. Um, and so I was able to not only teach in the classroom, but also, also get out into the field, which is where I'm really passionate about. Okay, so <laughs> there was also a big debate. This is about what I studied. <laughs> Um, so Salvar, who is the one in this picture, she asked me what the Icelandic word for clam, like we were trying to find it and she's like, it just keeps telling me it's sandwich. And I'm like, I don't know how to help you. Um, so the Icelandic word for clam and sandwich is in fact the same. Um, this was from, this is a translated version of my guest lecture in ecology. And it says, uh, on Friday, I'm going, or next week we'll have a guest lecture from Christina Gaithel, who's going to talk about sandwiches. Um, and I feel like now every presentation I give, I have to have a sandwich photo as an ode to my time in Iceland. Um, I, I just love this. And it, it was a fun kind of language thing, but ultimately it makes sense, right? It's two hinge shells with something in the middle. It's two. So um, this was one of my favorite pieces of Icelandic culture that I'm walking away with. And one of the words I will remember for the rest of my life. Um, and so we, uh, now Sean and I do have clams. Um, we've roped a few other people into it, um, hoping to look at the micro gut biome. Um, I'm really excited that we got them. Um, half of them are still alive. Um, but yeah, these are the ones that we're planning on kind of starting some preliminary data with uh, and pulling out um, their little innards and studying the microbiology. And then again, taking that and applying it back to the Pacific side, which is where I'm a little bit um, more comfortable, but I'm really excited to see like in a fjord in Iceland versus a continental shelf in the Pacific, when you have similar species, are they producing similar bugs that are helping them survive? So clams are really long lived. Um, they're a great species to study. Um, I'm also clearly not partial to them at all. I have clam earrings in like it's, it's in, or sandwiches. Um, but the other, so I, I came as a teacher, um, but I said earlier that for me, I really like also learning about things that I haven't done before. Um, there's, it's not, Phil Collins did not originally quote this, but um, there's a song in Tarzan that has the line in learning you will teach and in teaching you will learn. And I really love that. Um, and I was really lucky um, with Sean and Ava, who uh, agreed to teach me microbiology. I am a person with a biology degree that has never taken microbiology, which is not common and not really the best way to get a biology degree. But um, so they let me participate as a student. So I got to take my teacher hat off and put my lab coat on. Um, I was paired with an Icelandic student. Um, 
luckily, you know, I thought this was great. Like all the instructions were in Icelandic, but the drawings and the demonstrations filled, you know, most of the gaps got filled in. Um, and so there was only a little bit of English, like, okay, yeah, this is what we're doing. Uh, and so I was able to play student while I was here as well, which was really great. And I now feel confident in making anaerobic media for bacteria. Still don't feel super confident reading plates, but I don't know that I'll be doing that too often. Um, but it was nice to kind of take off that teacher hat and step into the role and kind of play student at the university that was hosting me in a topic that I know nothing about, but now feel a little bit more confident in. Um, the other thing, so again, Beth had, you know, her question on a cake, she was ready to go. I was just coming and seeing what was happening. Um, I don't have as many obligations back home. Um, I just finished my PhD last semester. Um, but uh, when I got here, I had had one of the local schools back home that I teach at, um, St. Mary's College of Southern Maryland, um, was really interested in the fact that I was coming to Iceland and asked uh, their new director of their marine science program, which is brand new, asked, are you able to, like, can we come up with some sort of collaboration? Can we do something? Um, again, second day I was here, first day I met Other in person, I said, hey, I'm really like, is this an idea? And he said, let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. Um, and so actually starting in May, I'll be teaching a joint course for three weeks um, and Sean's going to help teach it as well, but it'll be a joint course between St. Mary's College of Southern Maryland and the University of Akureyri. So the idea is to get the two schools kind of in the same room together and have American students and Icelandic students in the same space talking about the ecosystems in which they live. So the title of the course is Ecosystems and Their Role in Shaping Society and Economies on the International Stage. Um, and it's going to have three kind of case studies. So um, the Chesapeake Bay, which is in um, where I live in Solomons, Maryland, and also where St. Mary's College is based. Um, and then A. Fjordur here in Akureyri. And then using kind of my specialty in the Pacific um, as, as three different kind of case studies where, again, the Pacific is this benthic rich culture, the fisheries in Iceland. And then the Chesapeake Bay is also really rich in fisheries, but it's things like crab and oysters that are really driving them. But they also have things like striped bass, um, which is a fin fish and um, sturgeon, which is an endangered species in the area. And so using these three and thinking about how the structure of the ecosystem has, has led to things like fisheries being so important. Um, and the, the hope is to bring in locals from the community in all the communities to speak to the students and for the students to kind of just, start learning at an earlier, earlier age, they're in their 20s, they're adults, but, you know, and meeting people outside their, outside their um, current community. Um, and, you know, maybe in the future, some sort of formalized partnership where there can be an exchange between, between the two schools. Um, so now I, <laughs> cultural exchanges that I really love. So I've had some really excellent uh, people playing hosts for me as well, just like Beth has had. Um, I was a big, big fan of all the um, holidays around Ash Wednesday. Bola Dogger was my favorite. I ate more than I care to admit to, um, but that went back and forth. So I did ask Ava if I could put this in here before flashing this large photo of her, but she'd never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, for Americans, that's a like a staple as a child. So um, she did like it despite the look on her face. Um, but she's had me over for dinner multiple times where she's introduced me to Icelandic flatbread. Um, I have now brought her cribbage, um, which is uh, a card game that is really popular on boats. So all this international field work, that's often one of the things that brings the community together is playing this silly counting card game. Um, and I've created a monster she wants to play all of the time now. Um, I also really, I'm a big, big cat fan. Um, I have two cats at home that I really miss, but I have learned that this city has a lot of very friendly cats. Um, every part of my walk, has a cat that I've now bonded with. This one has snuck into my apartment a few times. Um, and then Ava's cat has welcomed me um, with open arms. Again, we're also teaching Munchkin how to play cribbage. Um, uh, and then I really, really loved the, um, one of my favorite things that I've learned about is the Yule Lads. I've become like really interested in deep reading about that stuff. Um, and when I got here, the Christmas cat was still up uh, downtown. And so um, I've really enjoyed the number of cats in this city, which I did not expect. 
Um, there's also a little bit of a history with my director and I back home. I don't know if he's watching, but there is a little bit of a history there. So this is a little bit of an ode to home as well. I, I do have a follow-up question. I've never seen popcorn used in so many different ways, and I don't know if it's Icelandic or not. I've had it in drinks. I've had it in ice cream. I've had it on top of cake. I've had it as an appetizer. Popcorn is my favorite snack food, so this was a really welcome kind of piece of home and, and to come into the community and, and see it everywhere in really unique ways that I've never seen it. Um, and so that is kind of a follow-up question for me is like, is that an Icelandic thing to have so much popcorn and things? Um, but yeah, so I've really appreciated kind of Beth was like real keen on the vegetarian stuff. And I was like, but all the popcorn, this is, this is great. Uh, finally, <coughs> um, heading back to the U.S., um, like I said, my slide, I'm learning a lot about social and natural scientists here. Um, I really, really love this Beta Redast kind of attitude and, and it'll all work out okay. I think for me, coming from the U.S., things are always kind of high strung and high stress and high energy. Um, and I've really enjoyed being able to take a step back and be like, it is going to be okay and, and it is going to work out. And so I'm hoping to kind of take some of that attitude back into the classroom at the U.S., but also back into my life. Um, just a couple of other things, like Ash Wednesday tradition, loved handing out candy here. That was a blast. Um, for those of you here, the kids dressed as the Beatles was just the highlight of my week. Um, I'm also have gotten very, very addicted to pizza tortillas, which a friend of mine here in Iceland was like, I thought those were American. And I was like, no, I've never seen them before. Um, apple scene skier, and, and I'm quite, quite fond of Brennavin. Um, but the other thing, and I think it kind of ties into this beta redust idea, is I have never gotten so many friendly emails from people. The smiley face usage, I don't think I've gotten a single email from someone at the university that hasn't had a smiley face in it. Um, and I love that. I it's it's cheerful and it's welcoming and it's open. And I've now put them in my emails back to people in the US. And I've had people be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, embrace it. It's happening for the rest of time for me. Um, and so these are just a couple of little small things that I've really, well, this one seems kind of big, but um, that I'm looking forward to kind of trying to incorporate when I go home and bringing, bringing a piece of Iceland back with me. Um, and then Beth had way better photo usage than I did, but this is just a brief snippet. Um, as she said, cold and hot water. I didn't react quite as strongly as Beth did. Um, I like the cold. There was a lot of running from Beth and a lot of sauntering from me. Um, and just kind of exploring. I'm terrified of horses, so this country has really forced me out of my comfort zone in a lot of ways. I've now ridden them twice. Um, and then kind of finding a, you know, a kindred spirit up there in the middle. Ava and I, I've never met someone that wears wild leggings like I do. And, and so that was a really welcome, <laughs> welcome piece of home and kind of exchange of like, oh, there's another one of us. That's great. Um, we now have matching crab leggings, which is a little bit of a piece of Maryland that I've brought back with her. Um, so that's kind of the end of my, just a lot of thank yous to all my hosts, Other and Sean and Ava. I've kind of lumped you in there now for adopting me, um, the other Aquarii Fulbrighters, um, and then the institutions, the university here, my home institution and, and Fulbright Iceland and Belinda and everything that's been done. I, again, I'm not, I'm not as organized as Beth. My contact info is not up here, but I will share it. Um, I'm here until June 6th um, and really happy to talk or if anyone has ideas for that course that's getting offered, um, it's a three-week course. So anything, I'd love to incorporate as much, any and all as, as possible. And I don't know what photos Evan's shown of his family anymore because I think we've hit all the highlights, <laughs> but I, if there's any time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Wonderful. Um, do we have any questions for Christina before we move on? We're sort of almost back on time. So if there, if there is a question, then... Um, I hope there's four chats, but I don't know if they... Should I click on them? Yeah. Well, I think they're... Are they pre... Okay, oh, now there's five. There's five, so there's a question. Okay, can I click on it? I don't want to like mess anything up. Oh yeah, let's go into the chat and see. Oh, it's a lot of. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's there's just no like, questions. It's just. Oh, it's just people okay. I know talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I surround myself with talkers. Where were the clams collected from? Uh, Salvor, that's a great question. Um, when I asked Sean that question, he gave me a map of Aethiordic, drew a large circle and wrote a question mark. So we're still figuring that out. Because <laughs> someone gave them to us. All right, okay, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have our final presenter. As I mentioned, you know, we want to try to have a broad range of, of people coming and, and doing, and the um, health sciences uh, department here um, asked to have a, a grantee in occupational therapy, and they made such a convincing and good argument for why it was needed and how it would benefit the program. Oops, sorry. And how it would benefit the program that, um, that we thought they had an outstanding application. So, and then we got a lot of applications for that particular grant. And Dr. Evan Dean was the lucky recipient um, who was better than everybody else who applied. <laughs> <laughs> No pressure now. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Belinda. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, my, my name's Evan Dean. Um, I do need to apologize that you've seen about half of my photos already. <laughs> we clearly did, did not, uh, did not uh, coordinate enough on our, on our images, but I think that really speaks to just the uh, the community that, that we've built, which, which is very exciting. Um, but so uh, I'm, uh, like I said, Evan Dean, I'm an associate director at the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities at the University of Kansas. Um, and I've been um, really uh, honored and fortunate to be here working with the <laughs> occupational therapy department uh, at the University of Akureyri. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, just kind of you know show the the Fulbright mission here in Iceland, which is really about increasing mutual understanding, sharing knowledge, and exchanging ideas, because uh, I think that is something that um, that uh, that my project uh, that that I, I feel like I, I have uh, really been a, a part of that uh, work, working with the OT department, and it, it, it's been really great. So I wanted to take a moment first to to thank uh, Belinda and her team at the Fulbright Commission for inviting me. I, I didn't realize how competitive the the OT position was, so uh, that's that's very exciting. Um, and also thanks to the University of Akureyri uh, and especially SIA and the uh, the School of uh, Health Professions, and of course Sonia and the occupational therapy department. Uh, I've been uh, so welcoming and I, I think that we've really had this great exchange of ideas um, that, that has been really uh, valuable for me and um, hopefully for, for you also. <laughs> uh, so I feel re really lucky. A little bit about uh, the University of Kansas. Um, <laughs> topography wise, uh, Kansas looks a little bit different than Iceland, I'll say. Uh, we are a, a primarily a rural and agricultural state, very, very flat, very good for, for farming and, and farmland. Um, we are also about one of the farthest points from the ocean that you can be in the United States. And we're also about an eight to 10 hour drive, depending on where you go from mountains. So, um, Things look very different here. We uh, so I guess in a little while I have a picture. I, I keep taking pictures of my walk to the university in the morning because it's different every day, and uh, and I just love the you know the water and the mountains right there together. It's been amazing. Uh, but in terms of my uh, work at the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities, one of the things that we really value and do is include people with disabilities uh, in our work as co-researchers. Um, and th th it's, uh, it's invaluable to our research um, to uh, learn fr from their perspective uh, and, and have uh, their lived experience inform our research. And it was a perspective that I uh, really wanted to bring to my work here with the department. 
Um, and it, it was so great of an exchange because it's a value that's shared by the department too. So it was really easy to get buy-in and, uh, and collaborators uh, using that approach. And I'll talk more about uh, the research as we go. So I think as an occupational therapist, one of the... Um, one of the things about occupational therapy, a lot of people don't know much about the profession, but uh, what we do is support people to live their daily lives and live meaningful lives. Um, and I think because of that, we're very oriented to notice daily living um, and the routines that scaffold a, a meaningful life. And so I think uh, it, it's probably based on that, that I uh, organized my slides the way that I did, that I really started with kind of uh, sharing with you some of the personal experiences and the daily life experiences that I've had here. Uh, so I'll start off kind of talking about that and then uh, move into uh, the research and the professional experiences uh, that we've had. But this picture was one of the first ones we took in Iceland uh, on our drive uh, up to Akureyri. You can see every, the kids in the back are all holding their bags because the back is stuffed with, with things. And <laughs> the funny thing about this is we landed on New Year's Eve and there was a, supposed to be a large snowstorm the next day. So we're like, if we don't go now, we're not going to get there for three days because the roads are going to close. So we left pretty much right after we got there. But we're driving and like every town we go by, there's these big fireworks displays. <laughs> and uh, and I, I mean, I know, I'm sure that that happens every time a Fulbright scholar lands and drives to where they go. And it was, it was very welcoming. So thank you for arranging that. But, uh, but it, uh, it, was, it was just a really neat way to, uh, to experience that drive and to see it. So uh, it was uh, just fun. So, um, well, I know, I know you've, you've learned this from the other presentations, but we traveled here with our, with our children and my partner. Um, and uh, I think, you know, one of the amazing things is that they have been so proud that they've really um, dove into this uh, experience um, and really um, uh, got a lot of meaning and things out of it. So they attended Brecca Scully. Um, and uh, have, have made a, a lot of friends. Their teachers have been really great about kind of adapting um, the lessons and, thi and things um, for, um, for uh, non-Icelandic speakers. But uh, aside, so they've had a lot of experiences through school. Th this is my uh, youngest son participating in the school performance. He was very excited because he had two Icelandic lines that, that he uh, memorized and practiced for weeks. Uh, one of the amazing things about this was uh, that we kept commenting about was the day of the performance, there were no teachers around ushering people to and from the stage. It was all, uh, I, I think we've been really impressed with just the kind of self-reliance that's uh, instilled in children here because they ran that production. Everybody knew their lines, knew what to do, and the teachers were just kind of in the background. Uh, we didn't really see them, whereas in, in the U.S., the teacher would have been right in front with the script and kind of mouthing all the words to be sure everybody knew, but uh, like the kids just really took ownership. And I think we've seen that a lot in the da in daily life too, that um, our kids will just go over to friends' houses in the afternoon, which was very, it was an adjustment for us Americans. Like we're trying not to be the helicopter parents and, <laughs> uh, and then the kids are just like, like going off and we're like, well, it should We've never met the parents. We don't know what it's going to be like at the house. Should we let them go? We're like, it, it must be a thing here. Like we're, we've been here for two weeks and this is happening. So, it, uh, but we're, we're very <laughs> thankful that, that we, we backed off. Um, uh, and, uh, and so the kids just had a great experience. They, they played in handball. My middle son um, uh, traveled to the Westman Islands to participate in a handball tournament. Uh, he went to Raker with, with his seventh grade class, um, which I'm told is an Icelandic tradition. We were very um, worried about that also, but that's, <laughs> I'll, I'll save those stories for later. I, I was trying not to go overboard on, on this slide. So, um, and then uh, just a, a couple of other things, like, like as I said, and, and uh, I know Beth and Christina talked about also, we walked everywhere in um, didn't matter how deep the snow was, we, we, we were walking, uh, which, which was such a great experience. 
um, and, and such a great way to, uh, uh, to kind of experience the city. A couple of the other things that, that we've loved were cooking. Uh, we, we came and visited the department four years ago um, and uh, spent a lot of time with the faculty. And uh, one of their partners taught us how to make a skier dessert. And so we've been talking for four years about we need to go uh, and we need to figure out this recipe. And we've, we've now shared it with, with everybody. <laughs> I, I don't know if we perfected it, but, it, but it's been very good. Uh, and then, as I said, you know, in Kansas, we don't get a lot of fresh fish. Uh, so we've been eating fish as much as we can and have just lo loved that. Um, and then the, <laughs> I had to include the embarrassing picture of me on the couch. We did have... Um, uh, about with um, uh, with COVID and the flu, as long with uh, about everybody else, it seems like. So that definitely changed our experience a little bit, but also uh, uh, you know created a lot of opportunities for for bonding and and creativity in the moment. <laughs> And then amazing people. Um, you, you've uh, you've already heard that you know we've really formed a community out of um, uh, you know with the uh, the other um, with Beth and Christina, the other Fulbright scholars. We've shared birthdays. We've uh, <laughs> exchanged tips on grocery stores uh, and and ingredients and things to buy. And you see in the picture in the upper left, I like to call that the future Fulbright scholar picture, where where Christina is uh, is preparing to budding scientists for uh, for a research career. And then uh, you know, especially the the OT department, it, it's been so it's been great to be a part of a. Uh, of a department that like really enjoys spending time with each other and uh, and and just values that time. So, uh, you know, that we went uh, Hulda organized cross country skiing for us and um, taught us how to stand up after you fall down on on skis, which took quite a while. <laughs> uh, but but it, it it's been the experiences with the faculty have have been really great also. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the professional experiences. Um, the, the department's been great, and it's been a really exciting time, I think, in, in the department's um, trajectory that uh, th there's um, uh, the, the capacity for research is growing and, uh, and, and like kind of ready to launch. So several people are in PhD programs. Um, and, and so it was a really great time to be here. A big part of my experience was developing some systems uh, to, uh, to continue that, that research trajectory and support that, uh, both through um, starting up a couple of research projects and then also thinking about, um, you know, some systems that, that we can use to scaffold uh, this, pro this going forward. Um, so, uh, so that's been very exciting. Um, the, I talked a little bit about my background already as, as an OT. You know, I've, I've worked mostly in the community with adults with intellectual disability and, and autism. And really, uh, my research focus is really on um, uh, um, supporting uh, everyday life uh, in the community, especially around uh, employment uh, for people with intellectual disability. We believe that, you know, People with disabilities should work and and live right along people without uh, without disabilities. So that's been a big focus of my research is supporting that. And so I've done that, you know, theoretically through uh, what we call career design. So the, um, this model is a um, it's an adaptation of um, a model called life design out of the career counseling literature. Uh, where we um, have kind of uh, furthered that for the disability community, including a lot of our research on self-determination, which is very big. So people um, acting and causing things to happen in their life. So using a career design perspective, when we're at, it's a departure from traditional approaches to supporting employment for people with disabilities, where the, uh, uh, the career um, development approach is um, you, you teach um, employment skills to work in a job, and then you stay in that job and, and work that job and kind of work your way up the career ladder for a, a, as long as you can, which, you know, a lot, a lot of the research and a lot of people's experiences is that that doesn't happen for anybody anymore, that people build a work identity and a career identity through multiple uh, uh, different experiences in work and in life 
based on their interests and their strengths. And, um, and through this, the important things are to really support uh, development of problem solving uh, opportunities, self-determination that can be applied across, um, across settings. So this is an approach that we take to our research. Uh, which a lot, a lot of research has shown, you know, it, uh, it promotes problem solving, uh, it promotes a positive sense of the future, it allows people to adapt to different changes uh, in, their, in their life and, and work environment. So we've uh, started applying that uh, career design approach to a research project. It, it, uh, it was exciting. Uh, I had conversations with Sonia right before I came that the University of Akureyri is considering starting a post-secondary education program for people with intellectual disability in, in, in the community. Um, and the University of Iceland has a program, and uh, like the, uh, the University of Kansas also has a program. There, there are several through the U.S., so it was an exciting time to be here to be a part of some of those initial discussions. Uh, but as I said, like I really try, you know, I have a real value in if we're going to do something like this, that people with disabilities and their families are involved in really thinking about what would be useful to them. It's not just that we're going to go create a program, but we're going to create a program because we know it's going to meet these needs of, of the people in the community. So since, since this was like, a, you know, kind of the ground floor of this project, I, I worked uh, uh, with, with uh, Sara and uh, Linda to, uh, we started with just doing focus groups, which we uh, actually recorded last week, uh, so uh, which is a, a exciting uh, to uh, to really understand the career interests and support needs of people of students uh, in Akureyri that would take advantage of this program and and their family members. So. Um, so we're really excited about this research. Uh, you know, so my, my project was four months long. This is actually my last week here. So four months to start a new research programs is like, like just about enough time to get it off the ground. So <laughs> this project will continue uh, after we leave. Uh, we, we have plans to meet up in a, a month, month and a half to, uh, to analyze the uh, results of the, of the focus groups uh, with plans to uh, write this up by, um, <laughs> I think we said August, but maybe October. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and and uh, the, the other thing that, that this opportunity afforded, uh, so I, um, I collaborate with researchers in Norway also, uh, where we're studying a different piece of the environment uh, related to uh, employment, where we're focusing on employers. Uh, so I had an opportunity to go to Norway for a few days and meet in person for the first time with, with the researchers there where, uh, where we worked on analyzing data and uh, outlining uh, a research project there on uh, employers. So uh, that was a, just a very exciting opportunity that just happened because, uh, because I was here. And so then the other thing, uh, the other project that we've gotten started uh, that I'm also very excited about um, is, is more related to the OT profession in Iceland. It's uh, uh, one of the, uh, I think th this is a struggle in the U.S. too and, and, and a lot of places and we've been reading a lot more literature about it is about fieldwork education that students have to attend at, uh, 10 to 12 weeks of like working real life uh, with, with supervised by another OT. It's like where you learn a lot of the real practical knowledge. And ideally it, it's a time where, uh, where students really begin to kind of mesh that real world knowledge with the theoretical and the evidence-based practice knowledge that's, that's learned in the university. Um, so it's kind of an anxiety provoking time for the faculty too, because um, it's also a time where students may, you know, become uh, more influenced by by their uh, OT faculty who uh, or their, their supervisors who are like, yeah, I know you learn that stuff in school, but this is what it really looks like. <laughs> this is what it's really like, uh, and this is compounded in Iceland because the profession. Um, doesn't have continuing education requirements for uh, for OT professionals. In the U.S., every three years we have to document 36 hours of continuing education. So there, so therapists and professionals are continually learning new approaches to uh, to practice. Um, 
So, uh, so uh, the uh, the department has done what I think is a very innovative thing with uh, with regard to fieldwork education, where they're doing coaching sessions. They're they're bringing the faculty supervisors and the students together with the faculty to do uh, some mentorship and to kind of subtly teach some of the the newer theoretical approaches and evidence based practices. Uh, and kind of explain why students are approaching things the, the, the way that they are to kind of facilitate some of those conversations. Uh, so it's a great way for to kind of inform the, uh, the supervisors uh, and also support students to kind of see how to integrate that theoretical knowledge in, into practice. Um, and so one thing that's missing from the field is evidence about these creative approaches to uh, fieldwork education. So. Uh, so um, working with, with Hulda and Hoftus uh, and Holmdus uh, in, in this picture to, uh, to do some other focus groups with, uh, with fieldwork educators to kind of understand their experiences uh, with, this, uh, with this new innovative approach to, uh, to uh, fieldwork um, supervision and supporting supervisors. So uh, very excited. We, we have the, those interviews um, or focus group set for uh, a few weeks from now, I think. And uh, so that's gonna be just very exciting to see. It's, you know, it's gonna be a big contribution to the field because a lot of people have talked about this as a problem, but nobody's really offered uh, you know, tangible solutions or uh, evidence of, of uh, you know, what may work. So I, 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 this will be really neat. One of the other things I, I felt really honored and really privileged to be able to do was also to support the community a little bit. So the uh, research, the career design research I talked about, uh, we, we've been partnering with a high school in Akureyri that supports um, students with disabilities. So uh, as we were kind of planning that, you know, they were talking about really looking for new ways to engage students in thinking about careers. Um, and so I, I was uh, felt really uh, lucky to be able to do a uh, training session with uh, with some of the teachers there on uh, career design and self determination to kind of uh, uh, demonstrate some new approaches. And we've had some ongoing conversations too about uh, uh, you know some possible exchanges or you know just some ways to kind of further that uh, that knowledge gain. So uh, so that that's been uh, uh, very exciting. And then uh, in teaching uh, was, uh, was going to, uh, originally going to be one, one of the larger uh, focus of, of my project. Um, but, uh, you know, after getting here and, and having conversations with, with faculty, it, it turns out that my uh, Icelandic might not be up to the standard uh, that, that would be needed to teach within the department, uh, but was able to do some guest lectures um, and, uh, and kind of uh, talk with students uh, about, my, about my research while then focusing more on kind of developing these systems and, and research projects. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, I feel like it's been, it's been a really well-rounded experience and a really nice exchange, both with students and, and faculty. It's been great. Then in terms of future direction, so we've been talking uh, with Sonia about kind of a, a extending our uh, involvement um, and, and continuing uh, some time with the department uh, to uh, both further the research projects that we've started, but also to uh, to help support uh, development of these um, uh, processes uh, and uh, and the scaffolding for for the research, so I'm very excited about that opportunity to to continue uh, my work with with the department. And then, in terms of uh, family and kids, it's been so amazing to see how the kids have grown, like to see their confidence building. Uh, my, my, my daughter is 14. So, uh, you know, it's been so great to just have her experience a different way of being uh, an adolescent girl um, in, a, in a different environment that I think she just has a lot more confidence um, and I think is uh, going to be prepared to go back uh, to the U.S. to like She's kind of found out who she is and uh, then kind of developing ways to uh, just continue to do that in, uh, the, in her school, which, uh, which is never easy for, uh, for anybody that age, but I think especially girls. So really excited to just see how all the kids respond when they go back. They'll get back to another week of school before the summer starts. So 
um, yeah, I think just so excited. Just, I think this is an experience that uh, I will certainly take, uh, you know, throughout my career, uh, but I, I think though they will take this experience throughout their life too. Uh, and it's going to just, I think, inform so much. And uh, so, so appreciative of the, of the opportunity from the Icelandic Commission uh, and the work with the OT department. And uh, it's just going to, yeah, it's just so excited about the possibilities and, and everything that this has opened up. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Finally, the most <laughs> consequential research that 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 uh, was conducted as part of this <laughs> was <laughs> we were having conversations. Uh, I have a little bit of time, right? The, this is a little bit off subject, but <laughs> when we first got here, the the malt and apple scene cans were were, were uh, you know in the stores everywhere, and we were talking to Beth and Christine like you got to try this. But it went away pretty soon after Christmas. We're like, oh no. Surely we can surely we can use a scientific approach to figure out the right ratio though, so that they can have the experience. <laughs> so we <laughs> we were uh, emailing back and forth, and I, I put together an abstract for a paper on, on our research that uh, to determine the proper ratio of apple seen to malt, which turns out is, is a one to two mixture of apple seen and malt, although a one to one uh, ratio is uh, is acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> that was by my youngest, so I had to put it in to, to, to be sure that his, uh, uh, so uh, anyway, ju just a little joke at, at the end, but, uh, <laughs> but again, thank you, everybody, R really uh, an amazing experience. Thank you so much. Um, do we have, uh, we have a question over here? Oh, hold, hold on for the question. Let us use the technology. Oh, yes. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Evan. Um, field work and occupational therapy just means like doing the job, right? Let, let me answer that question. Okay. <laughs> no, you can go here. Yes. That, uh, that <laughs> thank you for throwing. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, field work is, is where students go uh, to a setting where an occupational therapy works and an uh, occupational therapist works and then is supervised doing being an OT, basically. I have a second question. <laughs> second question. What, what is the OT um, field or profession like in Iceland in terms of size? And does that make a difference in terms of what is possible changing the profession? Mm. Is it growing? Is it small? Is it evenly distributed? Just any comments on that comparing to the U.S. would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and I think one, one of the things um, that I've, uh, I've, I've noticed and, and appreciated is that um, Iceland is a, uh, a small country where people generally know each other. So I, I think, you know, the faculty here, uh, it's the only program in Iceland, so uh, they know most of the practitioners uh, around the country. Um, um, so I don't know in terms of actual numbers, but, but I do know that um, there, compared to the U.S., there are many more practitioners here working in community-based settings, whereas in the U.S., it, it's predominantly um, medical settings and then also schools. So in, in the U.S., the um, there are laws, the IDEA, that uh, requires um, OTs and uh, other related professions, PTs, um, speech therapists, to work in schools. And that's not the case here, but a lot of schools have recognized the value of OT and, uh, and employ OTs, but it's not a mandate like it is in the U.S. So um, let's say a, a lot more um, community-based pra practitioners, probably fewer in the schools, and still a, a, a fair amount in medical-based settings. And I'm looking to my colleagues and seeing nods. So I think, <laughs> so, yep. All right. So, I mean, we're, I think at the end of today's um, events, I wanted to make actually a couple of comments before I close on, on, on a couple of things. First, um, regarding I can tell you that for all Americans who come here on a Fulbright, not least those who live in areas with lots of snow, 
their pet peeve is the lack of shoveling in Iceland. <laughs> Everybody talks about this and many note that their city governments would be out on their ears if they didn't do. So I don't know if we need to have like a Fulbright specialist or someone to come and teach because it's all over. It's, it's, it's no, no matter where you are in Iceland, this is everybody's pet peeve. And also I was so happy to see the photos of the aquadated cats. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to abuse slightly my position and say I certainly hope that the current legislation to ban caps is going to be thrown out the window with a swift kick. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, no, this is an actual proposal. So so let's yeah let's let's find out who's voting for the cat ban and make sure that they're not elected <laughs> um but no but in, so i just want to thank you guys all three of you for your excellent presentations today and what it shows me and what I always love doing this kind of event is it shows the diversity of our grantees and the projects that Fulbright supports because we had three very, very different um, presentations here today, but all of them were so interesting and so relevant. And it just makes me so proud that we have such fabulous people coming here and enriching our academia and our society. So I just wanna say thank you to all three of you. Um, and I wanna thank uh, those who joined us in person and the many, many people who joined us on Zoom as well uh, for being with us here today. Our next grantee presentation event is going to be next week in Reykjavik where we have um, a full day event. We'll be sending out information on that and we hope some of you will join us then as well. And thanks again to the University of Aquadata for, for hosting this here today and, and partnering with us on this event. So thank you everybody. Ready.